All right, this lecture is continuing in this vein of z-scores, the normal distribution, etc. Uh, it's hard for me to know exactly how to pull this together for you, so I guess what I'll re recommend that you do is watch all these videos, read as much as you can in the textbook that is related to this, and just try and make sense out of this. Uh, I'm hoping the videos all together will help you make sense out of this, but there's no guarantee that it's all going to be super easy or make sense right away. Um, it's not actually terribly difficult, but it is a leap. It, it, it is a mental shift. So hoping we get this all down. But let's talk in this distribution, or sorry, in this, uh, in this uh, lecture first about moving from the binomial distribution to the normal distribution, because that's how it works. Uh, Mr. Goss himself a couple hundred years ago, or maybe 300, I don't know, French guy, he figured out that you that the normal distribution should exist, that there's this bell curve shaped distribution when you make its its histogram or its frequency density distribution. And he figured this out by using the normal distribution. His suggestion was, what if we were to toss a coin and figure out the probabilities associated with tossing a coin an infinite number of times, infinity? So what would that distribution look like? And remember those probability distributions, the x-axis goes from zero up to number of successes. So we would go from zero to infinity in this case. Uh, so if we toss this fair coin an infinite number of times, let's just kind of work our way up there from a very non-infinite number of times. So this is the distribution of probabilities of getting a certain number of heads or successes if you tossed a coin three times, n equals three. So the probability of zero heads, one head, two head, or three heads. And this is five, uh, five coin tosses. There are six possibilities. Zero heads, one head, two heads, three, four, five heads. Those are all the things that can happen. And these are the probabilities associated with those things happening. Taller bars, more probability. So the highest probability is just almost one third probability in this case. It's the probability of two or three heads out of five tosses. So if we can move on and show the distribution of probabilities of all the different things that could happen with 10 coin tosses or any 10 random events where the probability of one thing is 0.5. 20 things, notice the bars are getting skinnier, very definitely pointy on top. You might start to see some gradual shoulder hipping thing there. People talk about shoulders and hips of the distribution, of the normal distribution, because it kind of has them. Uh, 50, 50 tosses the coin. Now you notice I'm zooming in here because this gets so teeny in the middle that um, you can almost see nothing after you get to you know, hundreds of coin tosses. So I'm zooming in, I'm only showing you 13 heads through 37 heads, just to show you what happens to the middle part that we tend to want to use. There's 100 tosses. See, the bars are getting skinnier, and the distribution is getting smoother. It's still jagged, but it's getting smoother. Here's 500 tosses of the coin. Notice it's getting pretty nice and smooth. You can really see that normal distribution here. It's just beautifully normal. Nice curve up here, and then it goes up, and it switches directions around here switches again, and then reverses directions. That's that's the normal distribution, that beautiful bell shape. That's it right there. This is a thousand tosses. I'm zooming in on just the middle, you know, a couple hundred really. And this is 500 tosses. I got rid of the lines between the bars because you can't really see anything but lines at this point. This is 10,000 tosses. This is 99,000 tosses. Now the Jaggedness is essentially the same as the resolution of your computer monitor. So you can see that you can move from tossing a certain number of coins and predicting the probabilities that might happen theoretically from that to the normal distribution. That's how it works. Normal distribution, sometimes called, called Gaussian, is something that we use a lot in stats. And most technically what we mean is the theoretical density function. It's like this. Uh, it's just a formula for that density function. Let me just skip back here. So density function says that if this is your x value, actually you have to convert this all to z scores. So, so if, if your x value was here, the density function says this is the height of y there. And then if here, then this is the y, height of y there. So that function is the function that describes that pretty little curve. It's an ugly looking function. I guess mathematicians might think it's pretty. I think it's uh, daunting. But sometimes instead of meeting the theoretical density function, we mean any um, distribution of values that's approximately normal because we're going to apply that theoretical density function to real world data even though it doesn't fit perfectly. So we imagine that the tops of the bars in our histogram are what should fit that density function. So if our histogram, if the tops of the bars look like that bell curve, then 
we've got a normal distribution there. So the notation we use sometimes, we use a capital N and then in parentheses mu and sigma, because a true normal distribution is always a population thing or a theoretical thing. It has an infinite number of values. And so we use the Greek symbols to talk about the true normal distribution. Now, a real normal distribution, first of all, isn't perfectly normal and uh, is a sample, usually, not always. Anyway, sometimes we'll put values in for mu, mu equals five and sigma equals 1.6 something like that, to tell us what we need to know about that distribution. And that really is all we need to know about that distribution. There are only two what we call parameters in this distribution, this and this, sigma and mu. You know what these are. Sigma and mu. I is a constant, it's 3.14159, etc. And x is just any value you might plug in. So this is saying, in a huge range of these x values, and this equation tells you how high the bar would be, or how, sorry, how high the... Uh, line would be at any of those x values. So there are a lot of specific normal distributions, but they're only different from each other in two exact ways. They have different means and they have different standard deviations. That's all. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. If different if two distributions have different means from each other and everything else about them is the same, then the only difference between them is one is slid further right or left on the number line. So this is SAT scores type data which usually goes from 200 to 800. Let's say there's a distribution here, it's normal, and it has a mean of maybe 605, 610, something like that. If we change the mean only to a higher number, all would happen is the distribution would be in a different place on the line. It would just slide over. If we changed it to like a mean of 700 or 690, it might slide right there. If we changed it to a mean of maybe 500, it might slide down there. But the shape and the width and the height and everything of the distribution, it stays exactly the same. For changing the mean, all it does is slide the mean around left or right on the number line. But it stays the same width relation related to the numbers that are on the number line on the x-axis. So if we change the standard deviation, now we're changing the shape. And there are only certain ways you can change the shape of a normal distribution. It still has to be that nice bell shape. So the only thing you can do with the shape is just make it skinnier or wider. That's pretty much it. Other distributions, you can mess with the shape in lots of ways, but the but the normal distribution, the only changes you can make to the shape are making it skinnier or wider. Otherwise, it's not a normal distribution anymore. So if you've got a normal distribution here and you change the standard deviation to make it smaller, then you still have a normal distribution, just a skinny one. But notice the center lines are lined up there. At least I tried to line them up there, so it's the same uh, mean. And if you made the standard deviation bigger, you just have a fatter distribution. It would still be normally shaped. And you've got a medium one, etc. So changing the standard deviation just changes the width, spread of the distribution, but it's still normally shaped as long as it's still a normal distribution. Otherwise, it's not, etc. Um, and changing the standard, changing the mean only slides things left and right. So quick reminder of z scores. If you can remember from the last lectures how to work this stuff out. Let's say you know that the median daily wages of all nations around the world, each nation has one daily wage, uh, da median daily wage, is a distribution that's normal with a mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 5. It's just not going to be normal. Let's just say it's a distribution, mean of 12, standard deviation of 5. So what's the z-score for a nation whose mean daily wages are exactly two standard deviations above the mean of that distribution? Sorry, I should say median daily wages. I made a typo there. Anyway, it's a distribution and the mean is 12 and the standard deviation is five. So you just take the mean plus two standard deviations. So a z-score, two standard deviations above, mean plus two, down, two standard deviations, the z-score is gonna be 2.0 and the raw score is gonna be $22 a day. z-score is gonna be 2.0, positive 2.0. So the same, same setup, what is the amount of money that is earned by on median, if that nation in, in a nation whose median day median daily wages are exactly one standard deviation below the mean, uh, ignore my typos and just go with this, it would be the mean minus one standard deviation. So you'd have a z-score of negative one. And if you want to figure out the actual value, you just take the mean minus one standard deviation, twelve minus five, so seven dollars a day. Or a nation whose median daily wages are exactly equal to the mean, well, the z-score will be zero. Zero standard deviations away from the mean. Z equals zero. And value will be the mean, $12 a day. So if you're at the mean, then your raw score value is the mean. 
and of course, because we just said that, and your z-score value is zero. So remembering that, why do we love z-scores? Because they help us find probabilities in the normal distribution. And then we will use those probabilities to approximate the probabilities in real data in situations where that makes sense for us to do. So when we think the real data is pretty close to normal, then we can do that kind of thing. And we're all done.